what I want to share tonight, and I don't know why, i got to be honest, when this word came to me, I have no idea why it came to me. Um, it came to me, uh, what's today, Friday? Wednesday. Um, specific things to be brought out in, to, for today. And as I read through it, before we were sitting there and reading through this one, Man, I, I don't know. You know, I've been in this position before. When you bring these words, you don't know how people are going to respond, and that's really none of my business. You know, as a servant, you just do what you're told to do. And I, I'm so okay. So, so we're going to start on this. <clears throat> uh, turn to Genesis uh, chapter two. Uh, what I'm going to speak about is what the Bible says about marriage. Genesis 2, verse 18 through 24. The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground of the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the Lord gave the responsibility to the man in this situation. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is not bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, in this day and age, marriage is all kinds of different things. But this is what the Bible talks about, and, and I'm not getting into uh, anything other than specifically marriage. And I wanted to uh, read some commentary from this. And I thought this was very interesting. It says, God gave marriage as a gift to Adam and Eve. They were created perfect for each other. Marriage was, just, was not just for convenience, nor was it brought about by any culture. It was instituted by God and had three basic aspects. The man leaves his parents and, in a public act, which is the act of marriage, promises himself to his wife. The second thing is the man and woman are joined together by taking responsibility for each other's welfare and by loving the mate above all others. Third, the two become one flesh in intimacy and commitment, a sexual union that is reserved for marriage. Strong marriages include all three of these aspects. So, when I read this, I think to myself, man and woman are put together for a specific reason, and ultimately, that reason is based on what God wants and intends for their life. You know, we have this conception of how things are supposed to be with marriage, and I see it now, I've seen it in the past, um, where people want to live together, and they think this, and they think that, and they don't inquire of the Lord. They just don't inquire of the Lord. And if the Lord would bring somebody to you, um, you might not want, you might reject that, is what I'm saying. You might reject what the Lord wants and has for you because you want this. Whatever that is, whether this person isn't attractive to you in whatever instance, but this is. And we will reject that. We will reject what the Lord has for us in a lot of different things. Not just marriage, but in life in general. So we hear these circumstances of people who are in illness, who are in difficult circumstances. I'm not sitting there saying that's the Lord's doing. What I'm saying is, those are our choices we make in life. We were ministering down at the prison this past weekend, 
<coughs> and one of the things I shared was the Lord was dealing with something with me and I didn't know what it was. And I had been asking and inquiring of the Lord, what is this in me? What is going on here? And I thought, I need this dealt with, whatever this is. And, you know, I could tell you, but you might be like, well, that doesn't, you know, that's not a big deal. But for me, it was a big deal. So the Lord finally showed me that almost, not immediately, it took a while. But he showed me that this particular thing happened when I was 10 years old. I'm 53 years old. 43 years I've been dealing with this and not even knowing I've been dealing with it. You know, we cover and hide things. We cover things up. We keep covering things up and we deal with it in certain situations. You can deal with it in anger. You can deal with it in drugs. You can deal with it in sexual immorality. You can deal with it any way you want. That's how we cover things up. And the Lord wants to set you free from that. He wants to set us free. So if I am... I guess for the lack of a better word, oppressed by this. For 43 years, I'm thinking, and I turned to the guy and I said, I'm a pretty slow learner. 43 years. And there was a man in front of me. He, 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 I could see something happened with him. He, he's like, shot his hand up. He's like, can I say something? And he said, basically, I look around, and we were. It was one of the things I was talking about was being married, and how my wife and I are the minority now, because not many people stay married for 25 years, and have two kids, and do things, and 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 that's and this was before I was saying this about, and and that's when he said to me, he said to all of us, I I didn't have any parents. He goes, my parents would leave for two, three weeks and not come home. And I thought, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. He goes, I had to raise my, ch my brothers and sisters. And he's 30 years old now, and he's been in and out of the jail a number of times. And I thought, this is what I'm talking about. We cover it up. So whatever we cover it up with, work, whatever, take your pick. We can cover it up with anything. We hide it. So here, you know, here is created the foundation that the Lord wants to put in, and he wants to do it in all of us. And this isn't just about marriage. This is about building the foundation on the rock. And when the Lord found me, he, didn't f he found me in a place where I would probably have to guess that if he hadn't done that at that time, I believe my wife and I would have probably gone down a much different road than we are now. There's no doubt about it. Good or bad, I don't know. Our children wouldn't be responding the way they're responding. They would be doing different things. Um, even, uh, you know, most children, when they get to a certain point, and this is what I said, they know... And they get to a point where they start making some money, they start having success, they start doing some things, and they get older and they think they know, but they don't know. They think they do, but they don't. And you have to say, okay, well, you have to go learn now. You want to move out, want to move in with somebody, that is not the right way to do it. Now, people do it all every day, okay? I get it. But that's not the right way to go about it. So now you have a division. You have sin developing. Because that sin is doing what you want to do. That's the bottom line for how I understand sin. We think it's this disobeying things. It's basically it's doing what you want and taking yourself out of the will of God for your life. And then you go into those circumstances that are not of him. It happens to all of us. Nobody is immune um, from this and when you hear this message I, I, I hear I see this and I hear this and I think I really don't want to deliver this message it's difficult because it sounds like judgment it sounds like um, like I'm better than you and that is not the case but we are the minority right now in this world 
We are fighting the battle. And it's the same with Christians all over the world. They're fighting a battle. And it's not just about marriage. It's about continuing on in the faith. Even the gentlemen in, in prison face a battle. A man got up and said after I said that, I, 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 have, I have three kids, and I probably really shouldn't be talking about this because I know it goes, goes out. But I think it's a, it's a good illustration. Everybody keeps telling me to find a church and get married. Now he's been living with this woman for 22 years and has three children. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? So you are dishonoring God because you, of what? You don't, what? What are you going to lose? You're already in this, you're here. What are you going to lose? Regret. Regret. Guilt. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And when you have time to sit there alone with your thoughts, it takes you to places that you should not be going. That's why we need to focus on the Lord. Let's go to uh, Genesis 24, 58, 60. 24 verses 58 through 60. Is that right? 24. Okay. Uh, this, I'm going to start in verse 57. Then they said, let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they call Rebecca and ask her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the gates of the enemies. Now, you look at this and you think, Here's what I read. Here's how I read it. We're sending you out with the blessing, Rebecca. We're sending you out with this man. We approve of this. Go and may the Lord bless you. See, Rebecca didn't say to her parents, I'm moving out. I'm leaving. Do you support this? This is not how it goes. And, and it was funny. I was, I was here. You know what's really funny? I'm learning more and more, and I think it's just the Lord opening my eyes to things. People will give up anything for a relationship with a man or a woman. They will give up anything. They will leave whatever. And men are no different, and women are no different, because they get lonely. And see... I'm no different. When I'm at home and everybody goes, I have to sit there and wait. And people don't understand. You know, I've, I've shared a little bit about my circumstances here, our circumstances, what I should say. You know, we've raised our children in the admonition of the Lord. What does that mean? We take them to church, we, we put them in Bible school, and then we, we hope and pray that they get it. Do they get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yes, they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, do they have gifts? Yes. Here's the funny thing. You can give that up. You can give it up. You can easily walk away from it. You can say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, but ultimately, there's something that's going to come along. How many people have left here where the Lord was working in their life? Mike, I know you've seen it. You have had to. The Lord starts working in their life. And they start responding, and you see this change in their countenance. They come in, and they're a mess. And the Spirit starts moving, and He starts working, and He starts working in their life. And next thing you know, they're moving, they're, uh, something happens, and they're gone. Because it gets so intense, because there is, there is an enemy out there that wants to take you out of the way. That's just the bottom line. But that enemy is also in us and it's called our flesh it's our flesh and you know <laughs> I, I, I don't really I, <laughs> it's it's 
it's comical that I stand up here and talk because I am one of the least people who likes to talk about themselves. I don't. And I don't like, I've, I've always been a person who would rather stand and be in the background and kind of hide and just kind of do things from the background. And I've always been that way. And, but then the Lord will come along and he'll show you. Is that really who you think you are? Let's see. I'll sit you down and I'll make you nothing. You nothing. Well, that gets a rise out of me. Wait a minute. Oh, I, th I, I, I come across as some great person where I'd listen. I fall short. I fall way short. The Lord's like, okay, I'll put you in circumstances. Let me show you what's still in your heart. You think maybe you've arrived a little bit. You, you get to speak every once in a while. Well, here, let me bring these circumstances upon you. I'll tell you to do this. And you think, and then next thing you know, you're going, I, I don't get it, Lord. I'm like, I did what you asked, but I'm sitting here and I don't understand now. Was I wrong? Did I miss it? I think all these things. And here's people in the Bible who are in their circumstances who are going out in faith. That's all through here. Rebecca, she had to leave her father. And, and we know about Rebecca and her story and a lot of these people in here when they go and there is a, a calling out and they go. But there's a right way and a wrong way. And I want to go to lost my place here. Here we go. I want to go to so marriage is God's idea. Commitment and that's what we just read is essential to a successful marriage. Um, let's see. What do I have next here? Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 33. Verse 10. Now when I saw this, I really didn't understand, but as I read more, this is about promises of restoration. And here's what it says in verse 10. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it is a desolate, it is a desolate waste without men or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, this is in verse 33.10, that are deserted, inhabited by neither men nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of a bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thanks and offering to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord, God, for the Lord is good, his love endures forever. Now, as I read that, I'm thinking, how does that pertain to marriage? And I thought, I don't really know how that pertains to marriage. Well, you know, it says marriage holds time of great joy. If you're, if you're married, what's one of the biggest joys that comes out of your marriage? I mean, as in, has you been married in here, what's one of the biggest joys that comes out of your life? Children. So basically what's being said there is, while this might be a desolate land, if I bring a bride and a bridegroom here, there is going to be great joy that comes out of this. So, how many people understand that about marriage? I want to, I want to, I just want to test her. I want to kick the tires on him or her and see what they're like. No. Why do you even need to, why do you even, why are you even pursuing someone? I've heard, I've heard missionaries come in and say, marry the will of God. I've seen a lot of things. I've been, around, I've been around ministries. I've been around pastors. I've been around churches. And I don't know how pastors do it. I don't. I really don't. It's probably one of the most discouraging things to be a pastor, maybe next to a doctor, because pastors lose souls. Doctors lose lives. I don't know which is more important. I would say a soul is more important because it's attached to the life. But there are many sick souls, and pastors... They, they want good for their flock, yet they see it. And, they, and that's why I think there is so much, I don't know what you call it, uh, um, 
a discouragement within the ministry. But I would go, and we were living at this camp, and there was a young girl who was <clears throat> in our dining hall one time, and she was, uh, she was on fire for the Lord, man. She was, 18 years old. People say, you have a boyfriend? You have a boyfriend? I tell them Jesus is my boyfriend. I thought, man, that's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. And I, and I, and I just looked at her, and I thought, I wonder if you'll be saying that same thing in 10 years. Are you going to be saying the same thing in 10 years? You know, when we're young and we think we know things and we're on fire for the Lord and we're right Jesus and we'll talk about Jesus in the school, not me, but I've heard of this. I would have never talked about Jesus in the school. Mm -mm. No, I don't have that kind of boldness. Not at that age. I was too busy not being Christian-like at all. And I thought, huh, I, I wonder if you'll be saying that in 10 years because the circumstances she was in probably doesn't promote that. And we say things, and then things happen, and then we, we, we move away. And we hear the message that's preached here. I know the message that's preached here about the, the Lord working in you. I mean, I've sat under Glenn Lester a long time. Um, you know, Glenn has, um, I don't know what it is, it, even when I was in his class, I was the only, it was the only opportunity that the Lord put on my heart to share, and he always opened the class to me, always. And I had to get up one time and speak, and, and you know, it's funny, when I would get up and speak, I would leave immediately after because I felt so... I don't know. Like, I got to get out of here. Inadequate. I didn't want people asking me questions. I didn't want, I just had to go. And the one time I got up, and there was two men in there who were going through divorces. They were on the verge of a divorce. And, and I don't know if they ever came back after this. I mean, it got loud. It got loud. And, and it, was the, it was not me. It was the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit was saying to, to everybody there, myself included, is it's not your wife's fault, it's your fault. You are the man. And if you're sitting here blaming your wife, you are wrong. And I mean, you, it, it just came out of me. And I mean, it was like people looked at me and they just sat there. And that's why I had to get out of there. Because, I mean, when the Spirit shows up and the Lord shows up, it can be powerful. I said, some of you are sitting in here and you are blaming your wives. You are the problem. And they were like shocked, pretty much like that. Now, how do you think that's received in this world? When everybody's told, it's okay, it's not your fault, it's this person, it's that person. No, it's your fault. Because it clearly talks about the man in here. And you know, we, men, shirk our responsibilities. I'm going to give you an example. My wife and I, you know, I'm not an easy person to live with. She says she likes me, and I'm of this and that, and I'm like, I don't see it. When we first got married, and I would work, and I'd go to school, and I'd do my things, she handled everything. She handled all the finances. She took care of the kids. She did it all. And that's what it says in here about a good wife. It talks about a good wife who will do everything in the Lord, not outside of the Lord. So my, my wife would do all that, and I'd be like, you know, honey, I don't want to, just handle it. You know, I, I got to focus on my career, and she would. What I was saying is I don't have time to listen to you. I got to focus on this. And that's wrong. I'm shirking my responsibility. And it's no different, even pastors, I've seen pastors become consumed by things. And they, they lose sight, not intentionally, but they lose sight of things. And all of a sudden, maybe the flock starts to dwindle. Or maybe you're not paying attention or whatever. You know how we need attention. So that, that was one instance. And then it flips. All of a sudden, I mean, immediately it flips <coughs> when the Lord found me. I didn't find him. I know I hear people. He found me. I'm clear on that now. 
I was seeking, and he said, okay. It's because it talks about in Second Corinth or Second Chronicles six nine sixteen, I think. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And he showed me. He showed me one time. I look and I see. Who can I use? You. I'm going to use you. And then he finds you. And then you're like, oh, now I got choices to make. Now how do I represent the Lord? It's like I was saying, you guys are in this, to the men in prison, you're in a good place here. You're lowly. You can't do what you want. But if you have an inward response, what's your outward action? So when you get out of here, yes, you're in here now, but when you go out there, are you going to go run with the same crowd? Because you can't run with the same crowd. You cannot. <clears throat> and I don't care how much you talk about Jesus in the bar or doing whatever you're doing in secret or with them in secret, <clears throat> doesn't work. Uh, Matthew <clears throat> 5.32. And this talks about, you know, unfaithfulness breaks the bonds of trust, the foundation of all relationships. Matthew 5.32. Sorry, I didn't get the mark that one. Remind me, I got to share one other thing too because the Lord gave me this to share as well. 5.32 uh, Jesus teaches about divorce. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital, marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Well, how much, how much adultery is going on in the world then? Okay. A lot. That's just one thing. <clears throat> and and it, doesn't say, it doesn't say, I hate the people who get divorced. It says, I hate the action of divorce. Which was a problem for me. This used to kind of stumble. I used to stumble over this because somebody had told me one time. I said, you know... They don't hate the people because they get divorced. The Lord doesn't hate them. He probably is saddened by the divorce because that's not ultimately what he, the should happen. It says in this commentary, divorce is a hurtful and destructive today as in Jesus' day. God intends marriage to be a lifetime commitment. When entering into marriage, people should never consider divorce an option to solving their problems or a way out of relationships that seems dead. In these verses, Jesus is also attacking those who purposely abuse the marriage contract using divorce to satisfy their lustful desire to marry someone else. Are, you, are your actions today helping your marriage grow stronger or are you tearing it apart? <clears throat> so my actions, when I was ignoring my wife, are harmful that's all there is to that period so I'm the problem so when I get up and I say I have credibility when I say to these two men who are blaming their wife you're the problem I have credibility with them and they don't like it that's why they don't like it because I know already that I'm the problem so I was thinking I was <clears throat> told you this word came to me Wednesday and, and the Lord's faithful and there are places I go where he comes to me and I go there <clears throat> I don't know how, why, I just find it funny where he comes to you, or us, me. <clears throat> I was, <clears throat> the Lord brought back to me one of my uncles, uh, my Uncle Eddie. Um, I don't know if he was a man of God, I don't know what his thing was. All I know is I saw a faithful man. <clears throat> and my aunt. Anne, who he was married to. My wife doesn't know them. I don't think you ever met them. My Uncle Eddie was one of those guys, man. He was just dressed to the nines, looked good, hair was never misplaced. And he had this like blue hair that didn't turn gray, but it was like a bluish tint. You ever see people who have that kind of hair? <clears throat> it just, it just, and he was very um, distinguished in his features. <clears throat> and my Aunt Anne, you can tell, she was very 
uh, attractive in her day. But what had happened is she was afflicted with uh, arthritis throughout her body. And she would come over and my uncle cared for her. And I, I admired him because she would, ultimately she was in a wheelchair and everywhere she went she was in a wheelchair because she could not walk. She could not move. I mean her hands were literally like this in all different directions. It looked so painful. She never, I've never heard her once complain. I never heard, she was a very soft-spoken woman. My uncle took care of her for years like that. And I think to myself, that's a godly man. Now, I don't know what his, his religious affiliation was, but he was faithful to his vows under God to his wife in his marriage. And I think to myself, I don't know if I could do that. I hope I could. It had to be through the grace of God that he took care of her. And <clears throat> one of the, we, she ultimately passed away. And it was a sad time. It was sad. Because he was devastated. He was devastated by the loss of his wife. I can't imagine the love he had for her. To do that. You know, we... I get, uh, um, I get annoyed when I have to rely on my wife for something. And now I would like, you know, maybe sometimes if she did take care of me more, but that's a whole other thing. That's something in me. But that's not what I've been called to. If you look at our circumstances, <coughs> that's what I, I make. I make a joke, and I should make a joke. It's like I've become Hazel. You remember Hazel, the show when the, she was the maid? That's me. I run around. I do the shopping. I do the cleaning poorly. I will tell you that. Um, you know, when my wife cleans, you know when my wife cleans, but I admit it, I know that I don't clean like her. Um, I do the bills now. I help her and guide her in different situations. And if you would look at it, you would look at it like you're taking advantage. That's what it looks like outwardly but nobody sees what goes on. Nobody sees what goes on. And I struggle with that tremendously because I remember, I remember when she was at home raising the children, she always would say, I feel like I should be working. I feel like I should be contributing. I should be this. And I'm like, yeah, but you are contributing. You're raising the children. You're taking care of the house. I don't have to worry about things. Marriage is not 50-50. It's not a 50-50 proposition. Sometimes it's 80%. One gives 80%, the other gives 20%. We get caught up in who did... I hear people argue over who did what 20 years ago. And it is, it is sad. It is sad what I hear come out of married people's lives 50 years, 60 years. You think, wow, did you even like each other? Do you remember? Do you remember the wife of your youth. It's funny, my kids, I always keep a picture of my wife and I know where the picture was taken. And I have it. I had it in my truck for the longest time. It's getting kind of, you know, beat up. So I put it in my garage where I have things and I see it. And it's, I remember the wife of my youth. Because there are things that go on in life. We change. We get a little heavier. We get we lose some hair. We do this. We do that. Things happen. You're not like you were when you were 20. We forget. We forget who we married and why we married them, because of all the years that have gone on. And and <clears throat> you know my uncle. I thought about that. I haven't thought about my uncle. I don't know, since. I don't know, since I was maybe 21, last time I saw him. I thought, why am I thinking about him? He's an example. He's an example of a faithful man. Very few. But women have a responsibility as well to support the man. And I'm going to get to that. <clears throat> See, I told you, I don't, I don't know why the Lord has me sharing this tonight. I, I, I don't know why. Um, I, I, at one point, I, you know, we like to think and Maybe it's somebody who's watching. I don't know. but And this is, this is one that I always uh, find that people struggle with. 
Um, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. And then it says, <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. So if the Lord calls me and sets me down to serve my wife, am I okay with that? If that's what he does, if that's the only purpose that he has called me to do, it's like take my uncle. I don't know what his financial situation was. I don't know when he retired. All I know is he took care of my aunt. It takes money when you have to care for somebody. How many people, how many people have we heard nobody is there to take care of them? How many here who have parents who are older and there's nobody to take care of them? And it falls to a child because they've either been divorced, lost a husband, whatever. Maybe never, well, whatever. I've had to do it. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing. There are many people who don't want to do that because they can't. And even in this scripture, the responsibility, and I know we live in a world where you read this scripture, it's like, how dare you tell me I have to submit to him? How dare you? He should be, he should be lucky he has me. Really? Really? If that's the attitude? I've heard women say things about their husbands. I'm like, whoa. I've said this before here. A man got up, he shared in, in that, on that Sunday service. He said, I've had to do two things the Lord has asked me to do, and twice my wife has divorced me. One, no, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Has threatened to divorce me because of that. And I thought, huh. Unequally yoked. He came to the Lord. She had an experience with the Lord, but hasn't come under the covering, so to speak. And we fight that. We fight it. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, maybe you don't. Maybe you've overcome that. Me, specifically, I fight against it. I want to be out doing what I think I should be doing for the so-called sake of the family. Well, what if my call is to be there when my children come home so they can tell me about their day and they don't have to worry about being alone. They don't have to worry about that. They know that somebody's there. You know, we didn't, we didn't have a free ride in this. We had to make sacrifices. We didn't have cable TV. We didn't have certain things. You make sacrifices. You know, it was funny. It was a little warm in our house the other night, and I'm going to tell on my daughter. It was a little warm in our house the other night because it was 96 degrees, and we set the thermostat at 72, and we forgot to turn it down at night. Now, some people will be like, I set mine at 75. I'm like, I'd be dying in there. <laughs> so we didn't turn it down that night. And all of a sudden, I come out, and I see her door open, and I know she's hot when the door's open because she sleeps with the clothes and has a fan on in there. And she said, this is precious. I said, what are they trying to do? Save some money? Because, you know, you, you turn the thermostat up to save money so it doesn't run all the time. And I laughed. I said, man, if I wanted to save some money, I'd turn it up to 77 in here and we'd all be sweating. But see, we get uncomfortable. You know, it gets hot. I'm hot, man. I'm hot. I'm sweating. I don't want to be sweating in front of people. But I'm hot. It happens. Spend some money, Mike. Turn the air on. <laughs> it's like, it is. I feel the heat, though. That's that light up there. Oh, I'm kidding. Um, so, you know, I, I enjoy, this is, I, I don't get to speak at a lot of places. I speak to the youth in our church. Um, I've had opportunities. Like I said, we go to the county jail, and, it, and it's, always, it's always a battle to get through. Um, when this word came, I, I thought, I, I'm like, I don't know, Lord. I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't see it, but I'm not you. You know, I, I'm not him. I don't know that. 
somebody here might be sitting here and this could be for somebody and they just can't say whatever or whatever. You know, the, the spirit knows who needs what. Um, you know, the other thing, and, and I'll, I'll just close with this. <clears throat> you know, we've seen our share of We'll, we'll talk about the scriptures and we'll, we'll, we'll use the scriptures to suit our circumstances. So we lose some people and we talk about being Gideonized because, you know, and, and maybe that's true. But I think, why do people leave churches? Now, my wife and I, we were uh, raised Catholic, both of us. When we had our first daughter, we had her in the CCD classes in the Catholic church. My wife was like, I can't have her in here teaching her this stuff. I mean, it was like the guilt trip all over again. And it was funny. There was a man I was going to graduate school with who I knew and grew up. And he said to me, hey, did you ever hear about this church? He's like, there's going to be the guest speaker there. And I can't remember who the guest speaker was. If, I don't know if you remember that. I said, no. He said, he hands me this piece of paper and says, check it out sometime. So I think we went. And I had been seeking. I had gone to Heinz Chapel down in Oakland because I worked in Oakland right behind the Cathedral Learning is where Heinz Chapel is. And uh, we went there and, you know, that's where the conversion came. Not in the church. It was actually for me, it was in Erie, Pennsylvania at a men's retreat that I went by myself that I didn't, I, when I opened this Bible, I couldn't find anything. And that's where the Lord found me. And this is where, that's where my testimony began. And he started dealing with me immediately on some things that were in my life that needed to go. And I, I responded. And, I, and I, I'm thankful that I did. But it just keeps getting more difficult at times. And for me, I guess what I would say to you is, you know, be encouraged. We've heard the songs. I mean, you have a beautiful voice. You know, I mean, that's a gift. Um, use it. You know, uh, there's something going on here, Mike. I don't know what it is. Keep going. I would encourage you to do that. Um, but like I said from the first time I spoke here, you can't do this alone, Mike. You can't. You, and I know you have Glenn helping you, and I know you have some other people helping you, but one of the things we don't do is we don't ask for help when we need it. I'm guilty of that. You know, and I know you're probably the one who's always helping people. Whatever that means, I don't know. You know, I hear that from people that, you know, he'll help, ask him, he'll help you. I'm like, well, maybe he, learn, he needs to learn how to ask for help. And, you know, I get it. You know, I get it. But sometimes you need to ask, and, and maybe... Like, and like I said with the person who they wanted their son to get a job and just came out of prison, not jail, but prison, maybe you need to ask the Lord for a job. You know, you can go and goes online, doesn't have a resume. He goes through the whole process because everything's online now. You got to go through the process. No, you can't just walk in and fill out an application anywhere anymore. And I'm, I'm kind of getting off, but you know, maybe you need to ask the Lord for some help from people. And, uh, you know, he's probably been sending you p to p people to you. I, I hope that you, you know, utilize them and their talents. Um, I'm just going to close. Anybody want a specific prayer for anything? I'm going to close in prayer and then I'll, I'll be done. Tina? Pray for... Okay. 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 All right. Well, Lord, I just uh, I thank you for your word here tonight, Lord. Um, I thank you for your faithfulness and your grace and your mercy towards us, Lord. Um, I pray that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit accomplish whatever you want it done here tonight, Lord. Um, I pray for those ministers on TV, Lord. Um, I don't listen to a lot of them. The one I do listen to, Lord, I pray that you help his ministry and you bless it and, 
he, he st truly speaks the word of God. I hear it. I hear it that it's spirit-filled. The others, Lord, I pray that you, um, that it's not about the blessing or the prosperity gospel, Lord, but about the blood of Jesus. Um, sometimes that can be lost on people. You give to get um, when it really isn't about that. Um, it's about, you know, calling on your name and asking for forgiveness and, and cleansing of us, our sins. And as we heard in the song, Lord, a uh, turning our crimson sin into, uh, into that pure white soul that we, we desire, Lord, but we fight against. So, Lord, I just uh, I thank you for this time. I lift this church up to you, Lord, and I, I pray, Lord, that you send helpers to Mike, Lord, and that he responds to what you're calling him to, even if he has to lay down some things, Lord. Um, maybe you should lay them down for him, Lord, and, and do that for him so he, he responds, Lord. Um, I just pray for your blessing and your spirit to come upon the people here, Lord, that when they leave here, that whatever was spoken, it sinks in and... Uh, there's something that comes from this. So um, I just thank you again for this time and this opportunity to be your representative here, Lord. Amen.